How many of you are business owners? Okay. How many of you are long-term investors, buy and hold? Okay. Thank you. And how many of you are traders, buy and sell? Okay, great. Just gives me an idea of, the, of my audience. Welcome. So from my side, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate your support. Thanks for supporting uh, PG Wealth and uh, Just One Lap and also the JSC. Um, before we get started, do you mind if I just tell you a bit more about myself? I know, some, I know some of you guys, but most of you have never heard of me or seen me. Um, I head up client education at PSG Online. I've been with PSG going on, uh, or PSG Wealth, PSG Online. Been with PSG going 15 years. So I've been there right from the beginning when we were small entrepreneurial. Now we're a big corporate. Um, I'm the one that does the seminars. I do, I do the webinars. I write the daily reports. I'm the technical analyst. So some of you might get my reports and things like that. Um, Tonight, well, the next, say, 45 minutes to 50 minutes, my goal is to um, highlight seven things for you. First of all, um, to introduce what our research department. What do we actually do, our philosophy behind our, our research, our fundamental research? Uh, but also to highlight, for example, the theme was, I think, like a business. It was originally as a businessman, so I changed it to business person. I thought it would be better, gen, watch it, uh, uh, gender correct. Okay. So the, the, the focus is obviously buy the business, not the stock. That's is a, one of the main themes I want to get across. But also for you to understand uh, the importance of having an investment philosophy, um, but also how to es in estimate a intrinsic value. What is the true value of a share? Um, the quality of a stock and how to understand the business. And bottom line is um, obviously concerning the alternatives. So that's quickly the agenda what I want to get through today. Um, as a quick introduction, let me explain to the, the, uh, how our research works. So when I say research, it's our fundamental research. Um, we're aimed at the private investor, like you guys. So we're not institutional. We don't do any research for Sunlam or Old Mutual or anything like that. Um, our purpose is to enable you as a private investor to compete with the institutional investor. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've been around for 15 years. Our competency is that we've got all these models that have been working very well for over 15 years. Uh, and they're specifically designed for you as a private investor. Um, they're timely. Compared to our, to our, our competitors, we get our reports out very, very quickly, usually a day or so after the report comes out, the, the financials. Um, our aim is medium to long-term valuations. And then also um, our, our goal as such is to um, focus more on the numbers. When, we say, when I say numbers, it's quantitative-based valuations. And also, obviously, we don't cover all the stocks. We cover uh, uh, most of them, We're about 250 stocks. It's mainly focused on the financial and industrial shares. You'll see just now why, why we do that. We do touch, we do highlight some of the mining stocks. The main focus is on the financial industrial shares. So um, if we're doing 250 stocks and then we have two reporting periods, year end and interims, we do about 500 reports a, a year. And then obviously in between, we also do a lot of recommendations. So there's about 750 reports that we put out a year. Um, trading platforms, obviously PSG Wealth, we are an online stockbroker. Trading platforms are, is a commodity. What's the differentiating, differentiating factor is the content, the value add. And I think that's where PSG over the last few years um, have, have set, set us apart from our competitors, that value add uh, we give on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the research. So the whole idea is that we can serve a whole range of investors. Um, we have various tools. I call them time-saving tools. Oh, Simon, what's happening here? Okay. Um, sorry about that. Okay, where were we? Okay, various tools. They're search engines. We've got various search engines. The big time saver, we can screen the, screen, screen the market um, and find the opportunities. So it's a big time saver, and I'll show you how, how we use that a bit later. Um, so it's focusing. I always use the analogy of, you know, can you remember the good old days? We used to prospect for gold in the rivers. You had to go through a lot of gravel to find the gold nuggets. Now you're ignoring the gravel and focusing on the gold nuggets. So you're fa focusing that time, and then you have more time to do more in-depth analysis on the companies that might interest you. So that's, that's where I say it's a big time-saving tool. 
So this is how we've, uh, our research um, breaks up. So 73% uh, is focused, as I say, on the financial industrial shares. There's roughly about 97 shares. 17% um, is, is mining, okay? So it's a small little sliver there. Um, some of the stocks we don't cover. The property companies. The property companies are rental income. So they, they, we, don't, we don't cover those, those companies. And obviously, PSG Group owns quite a few shares on the market already. The Kuros, the Avitex, uh, not the Avitex, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Kuros, the uh, Capitex, and those kind of guys. So obviously, there's a conflict of interest. We can't report on those companies. There's about 12 companies that we have our fingers in somehow. Okay. So you can see our spread. But uh, 209 of the uh, 304 shares, so 7 out of 10 stocks we do cover uh, from a research point of view. So that's about, as I say, 90% of, uh, of the investment universe we do cover. <coughs> so what puts us apart also is our, our quicker delivery. This was a little, a little test we did between February and, and March this year. Uh, on average, we get our reports out three days faster than our, than our competitors. So yes, you'll find some of the small cap stocks, like, they, like Dawn, we're 15, 15 days earlier than our competitors. Yes, yeah, Silver Beach, we're like nearly 20 days earlier. So the big large caps, yes, we're there, but the, the small caps, we're way ahead of everybody else. So that's, and that's where most of you guys will be investing, some of the small cap stocks. So let's get into the nitty gritties. Uh, Warren Buffett, if the, if, the, if the business does well, the stock eventually follows. So remember, they buy the business, not the stock. That's just the main thing we want to get into. So let's talk about the business. So there are two approaches to the market. You can obviously be an investor or a trader. And some, some of you stuck your hands, and some of you stuck your hands up as a trader and investor. Some of you didn't stick your hand up because you're not so sure. <laughs> okay. So what is the big difference between a trader and investor? Anybody? Time your time horizon, exactly. Okay. So the investor, you have a long-term investment perspective. Um, you know, the short term, what's happening short term, doesn't matter. It's like buying a property. Okay, you buy. I'm going to use an analogy of, a, of buying a property in, 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 a, in a golf estate in Pretoria, and your next-door neighbour is a celebrated uh, Olympian paraplegic, and one night you hear shooting and barking and shouting in that. Do you sell your house the next day? No. Okay, and that's what happens with, with, with the traders. They'll, they'll in and out the market. As a, as a long-term investor, you're buying the property because you see value and you get older for longer term. Okay, you've got to do that kind of an analogy. So um, you're more value orientated. You want to go for companies that, that will grow either by, by increasing market share or they're selling enough of their widgets uh, and volume that they'll be around for longer term. You're going to buy into companies that have good quality. We'll talk about quality a bit later also. But also you must be able to understand the business. Some of you guys know Warren Buffett doesn't buy into anything he doesn't understand. He doesn't buy into technology companies. It's for a long time he didn't buy it. I know he has bought into IBM now. But the idea is that you as an investor must understand the business, what you're buying into. And then lastly, obviously, you want to consider alternatives. Going back to my analogy of the property, you know, you, before you buy the property, you, you look at what's, what's available. You might, might look at other, 10 other properties and then decide which was the best one for you, saving now as an investor. Okay. As a trader, on the other hand, um, you're going for the highest return in the shortest period of time. Okay. So what is the big difference? It goes down to your risk-return uh, philosophy. Okay. I always talk about a, a conservative investor. Someone goes for low risk, low, low returns. I'd rather put your money in the post office. If you want to conserve, conserve your capital, the stock market is not for you. You want to go up a scale where you're going for high returns, but at low risk. It's what I call a prudent investor. So you want to bend the odds in your favor. If you move across the scale, you go for high risk, high returns, and you're an aggressive trader or aggressive investor. But you should never be in the last little quadrant, what I call the speculators, the gamblers. Someone who's going to go for high risk at low returns. And that's what a lot of people do get into. They buy into, into stocks that are that are dogs. <laughs> they were five rand and now they're five cents. You know? From there, we're going to be suspended and delisted. So that's the main difference. So let's talk about investment philosophy. Um, and this is how we base our, uh, our, our research. I did a study a few years ago. Um, this was based on a, uh, on a research conducted over a 40-year period from 1954 to 19, uh, 1994. It was only on, on 50 companies. 
And the whole idea was, if I had $10,000, what are the best quantitative, what are the best numbers, what are the best ratios to use to find me the company's going to give me the best returns, it's going to grow the most. So every year the, the, the portfolio was rebalanced. And uh, you'll see that over this 40-year period, that was the average of the stocks. So you can see it uh, gave you about 12%. So your $10,000, okay, which was made over a million dollars over a 40-year period. So, but interesting, these are all the different financial ratios you'd use. Some of you have heard of this before, a uh, 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 low price to sales ratio. Most of you have heard about this one, low PE ratio. Okay, everybody says go for a share with a low PE ratio. But it's interesting to note, anything to the left, so even to the right of that, of the average, you are underperforming. Even to the, to, the, to the right, you are outperforming. So you find on average, we're, we're outperforming between 14 and 16 percent. With $10,000, you know, it grew up to one and a half million, up to, up to three million dollars by using these financial ratios. And that is what our philosophy is based on. So the idea is that's our starting point. If this has worked in the past, this uses a starting point, and let's build on from there. So we're going to talk about these little four, these four financial ratios, and this is what our whole model is based on. Okay. So those are the, the three ones we, the three ones we use, use the most. So how can we improve on that? So we, the whole idea is that it's been, it's been proven. You read all the books. Companies with a low price to sales ratio, a low price to, to revenue ratio, relative to normalized operating margins, you'll find those are the companies who, that will that will grow, have the potential to grow. Companies with a low price to net asset value relative to, a, well, compared to a sustainable return on equity will also grow. And then thirdly, you know, we talk about you want to buy a share that's got a low price earnings multiple. That's what everybody wants to go for. But also you want to combine it with growth. You want to have a sustainable growth. So bottom line, this ultimately ends up what we call a uh, contrarian research and Warren Buffett has said it before. Some of you guys have heard it before. Be fearful when everybody else is greedy, and be greedy when everybody else is fearful. So obviously, we're going for the stocks that have been sold off. It's been hammered by the market. And what kind of stocks have been hammered by the market lately, for the last, last year and a half, two years? Your resources, your construction companies. So obviously, these are the stocks that will pop up with this kind of um, uh, analysis. Okay. The unloved. <laughs> the forgotten. So, so, how do we improve on those numbers? So, we not only look at a, a, a share with a, a low PE, or we're looking for a share that's trading at a discount to net asset value, a share that's trading at a discount to its NAV. We don't ignore that. We don't just look at that. We also look at the quality of the earnings and as well as the growth in the earnings. So, that's, that is the core, but what's more important, central to our philosophy is our Benjamin Graham's You've heard of this phrase before, that margin of safety. Okay? You want to have a margin of safety when you're doing your research. So we're not only going for companies with, companies with good growth potential, but you also have limited uh, uh, downside. That's most important. Okay? I always joke, how do, you start, how do you make a million in the market? You start with two million. Okay? So we know this is not the same scenario. Okay? So... Um, you pay for what is seen, not as what was hoped for. I always, well, I always tease the traders. I said, hope is not a strategy. Okay. And then obviously the whole idea is we've been, as I say, we lean towards quantitative. The numbers, we use the numbers to help us make decisions. So that's on the one side of the coin. On the other side of the coin, we do not, we're not, we're not momentum investors. We're not, we don't chase the hot stocks. Now the stocks are flying through the roof. They've got a high PE ratios and things like that. We don't, that's not our, our, our philosophy. So we're not chasing investment growth, irrespective of what's happening with the price NAV and the PE ratio. Okay, so the high growth stocks, okay, have more considerable downside. So you've got the, on, the, on the one side, you've got the resources and construction companies down here, and you've got the high flyers up here. Who's got a, big, who's got a bigger chance of dropping at, at this point in time? Those high flyers, okay? Those companies have a PE of 200. You know, we know which company I'm talking about, okay? We're not, we're not involved with them whatsoever. <laughs> um, but those companies, you know, there's a saying in the market, the PE will come down to a more, to more, uh, uh, more realistic level, down to the average, and then below it. We saw it years ago, those who've been around for a long time, Dimension Data, way back in 2000. Dimension Data was trading on a 75 rand a share, and I think the PE was a 78. It's going to take you 78 years to cover the current earnings out of the current share price. 
We know what happened to share price. It dropped from 75, 75 Rand right down to 165. Eventually it was taken private. Now it belongs to, Jeff, to uh, Jeff, what's that, uh, Nippon. Okay. And that was uh, the darling of the market. The same thing with high flyers in the market. So you've got two, two scenarios. You've got the high flyers overvalued, and you've got the out of favor stocks where I believe there's opportunity. So we are folk, we are value investors. Our whole website, our research is skewed towards value investing. And who is the most famous value investor in the world? Warren Buffett. Okay, so we do use that kind of quantitative analysis. So if it's so simple, why is not everybody a value investor? There's three main reasons. Number one is that se se the, the, who wants to buy the shares of falling? Because what happens, a lot of us do, we extrapolate it. If the shares are falling, it'll carry on going. In trading terms, we talk about the trend jaw, friend. So we anticipate the trend will carry on going up. We go, sorry, going down. And the shares shooting through the roof. Those high flyers, what do, we, what do we do there? We also extrapolate that. They're going to carry on going up through the roof. Okay. So that's the that's one thing. So the, the, the process is not really, really popular. Why well, buy the shares that are falling? I want to go for the high flyers. Number two is that as a value investor, you're going contrary to everybody else. When everybody else is selling, you're buying because you see the value in there. The problem is you need patience now. And the problem is a lot of us lack the patience to sit it out and wait for the market to get into the idea that there's value in these shares and obviously demand to push the share price up. So that's the biggest challenge there is being patient and waiting it out. And then thirdly, and I think this is the, the, the biggest challenge for most people, you know, money is important. This is too simple. I need to complicate it. So it's too simple for people to grasp. And value investing, you're a bargain hunter. The ladies, where they walk past Eggers, Eggers has got a 50% sale. Do you think they ignore it? They go in and see what's available. The JSC is having a, a sale at the moment in the resource sector. Okay. So there's opportunities. So how do we estimate the value of a stock? And this, as I say, this is based on those numbers uh, we are talking about just now. Um, NAV, net asset value. We take the company's assets, sell for its liabilities or pay for its liabilities, divided by the number of shares in the issue, you get what we call the net asset value of the company. That's where if the company had to go into a, a fire sale, that's what the shares were. So you can loosely compare the net asset value to the intrinsic value of the company. Okay. Um, and obviously PE as, as in for, um, for, for growth. The ideal way is to look at what they call the discounted cash flow uh, module or the valuation uh, method. So yeah, we're using free cash flow. This is over and above the company's operating uh, cash flow. You'll use that as a base. And our side, we use a peg. Okay, we use a rule of thumb, we use a peg. We use the EPS, earnings per share, as a, as a base. On, on the discounted cash flow, you need the free cash flow figures, those numbers, and they're not freely available. That's a challenge for a lot, for a lot of us as private investors. EPS is available for all of us. We can get, get onto financials, and we can find the earnings per share of the company. Um, the challenge with the, 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 with the discounted cash flow valuation model, the forecasting time, it's, it's, it's quite laborious, number one. And sometimes there's mistakes you're making with the discount rate and things like that. So there's a lot of errors that can creep into it. There's a lot of historical data, back data. I can say, okay, there's a trend. The earnings are growing roughly about 10% or 15% per annum. I can extrapolate from it. But I can hist historical data, data to help me. Um, and obviously, on the discounted cash flow side, I can, I can adjust for risk with a discount rate. Yeah, I use a quality filter. So I'll be discussing the quality filter on our website just now, how we, how we look at safety, okay, and manage the risk. So to say, it's tedious, the calculations, yes, quicker, simpler, faster, better, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Uh, most accurate value. So this kind of cash flow is the most accurate method, yes, but it's, it's not easy. Yeah, we're using a whole lot of other stuff. As a, we call it a ballpark figure, but it's in a range where the share undervalued, as long as earnings estimated to, to cash flows and it, the biggest challenge is just the reporting periods but uh, that's a, the, the model we're using okay so we use the peg we're talking more in detail now about the peg so what is the peg ratio it's a good proxy uh, as, as alternative to that gives uh, this kind of cash flow valuation model so as long as the earnings are approximate or is similar to we can say it's similar to the cash flow we, we say it's the same um, the peg value Depends on the interest rate environment. Obviously, we're still in a very low interest rate environment. Um, 
So we'll talk about the color coatings just now. You know, we talk about between 35 and 75 being undervalued. We go as far as 85 on the, on the, on the peg ratio to looking for value. So it all depends on the interest rate and valuation. So it's all relative. Uh, it's a relative valuation technique, relative to earnings, relative to return on equity, a whole lot of stuff we look at. But all this information is readily available for you, but we save you the time. We've done it for you already. It's on, the, on our website. And obviously, it's easy to understand. The, the big thing there, it's easy for you as a private investor. The biggest challenge, okay, is for companies that have volatile earnings. And that's why we don't cover some of those mining companies. Some of them are loss-making. <laughs> you want to stay away from those companies. Okay? So that's where the, where, the, where the challenge comes in. But there's other ways we compensate for that. So the peg ratio, what does the peg ratio stand for? It's the PE divided by, uh, sorry, the, the price divided by the earnings divided by growth. Okay? So on our website, we color code it for you. You can basically look at the market being segmented. The bottom 25% as being undervalued. The middle part, the fair value, is about 50% of the market. And then the top 25% is overvalued. Okay. So we color code it for you. Overvalued on the peg ratio, and you'll see how we do the calculation just now, is anything over 140 on the peg. We consider that as overvalued or expensive. Anything between 76 and 139, it's yellow, it's fair, fair value. And most of the market is trading at fair value. Um, so that's that range. You want to concentrate on the greens, on the shares that are green, undervalued. So you, you get this paint by numbers, you only, you've got to invest by color. Buy the greens or ignore the reds. <laughs> okay. Maybe consider the yellows. And once in a while, also you might consider the speculatives. The other, this is where the share price has fallen. It's gone so far, it's, it's, it's so cheap. We also highlight this risk involved. There's something, something's happening with this company. So the insiders are selling off this company and hasn't been discounting to the price yet, or the market doesn't know about it. So it's important to you. But that's where you also pick up, pick up the opportunities, the speculative stocks. So let's talk about all those different numbers together. The PE ratio. The PE ratio we use is slightly different to the market in the sense that we use normalized earnings. Okay, so we, we normalize it, we smooth out the data, we take into consideration the cycles and things like that, but we smooth it out. So the earnings are updated with all the trade upsta uh, the updates and the trading statements, all that kind of stuff. We update uh, the numbers. So we take into consideration acquisitions, if there's a, a, a new, a new issues, or a new stock being issued, um, share buybacks, all that kind of stuff. Reconstructions is share splits, all those kind of stuff. We take it in consideration with regards to the EPS number. Because more shares an issue, obviously dilutes the EPS and vice versa. So we take it in consideration. And then, we, as I say, we differ from other publications with our PE. We use a rolling PE. Rolling PE, instead of uh, what we do is uh, we calculate the EPS over a 12-month period. So it's, it's continuous. That's why we, and it's always comparable to its, to its peers. So that's a big difference, a rolling PE. It's sort of a historical PE. We have a rolling PE. The whole idea is the value investor is updated live. So that value investor you see um, on our website, the worst case scenario, we, you can subscribe to 50 minute delayed prices. That's the worst case scenario. Those, 50, those prices are 50 minute delayed, but that whole matrix changes. The PE ratio has changed. It doesn't change radically, but it's, it's, it's the most up to date information you've got on the company. An idea there is for you to make more informed decisions right on the spot if this company is there, is there value in this company. So that was the PE ratio. We talk about the growth rate. The growth rate, we use a five year model. Okay, three years back and we forecast two years forward. So, and we, we're using on, on, on the EPS, we normalize, as I say, that EPS, we smooth out for the cycles and things like that. And from there, we compound from there. So, let's talk about how this thing, how the peg works. You get two stocks. Stock one, stock two. Okay, one's trading at one rand. Remember, the market's always in cents. Other one's trading at two rand. They're both on the same PE. Now, what a lot of people do now, they look at the PE and then they look at the price. Ah, let me buy the one rand share. It's easy. It's, it can double from one rand to two rand. Great. Warren Buffett says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Never buy a share just on price. Look at the value. Okay, so how does the peg ratio work? The PE divided by the growth. This company is growing by 30%, other one's growing by 10%. So 15 divided by 30%, you've got a peg ratio of 50, which is considered very, very cheap. The other company, 15 divided by the 10% growth is 150 peg. That's considered very expensive. 
And then the average of the sector, you can see it's 75%, which we consider still fair value. So, the whole idea here, remember, it's five years. I'm, I'm doing a bit of a repeat here. But you can see, yeah, the company, that's the average of the market. That's at 75. Okay? We're below the average, we're below the fair value. So, we consider that cheap or undervalued, and that would be expensive. Okay. Um, the whole idea is that peg ratio works better. It works great for the retailers. It works good for companies that are service oriented to that kind of stuff. So the companies are sustainable earnings, the sales growth, or is nothing erratic okay, compared to like resources and mining stocks. The problem with, as I say, the mining stocks is that volatility in earnings at income stream. So as a proxy, we use what we call the, the ROE and the price NAV. So, yeah, it gets a bit more complicated. This presentation, I believe, will be sent out to you guys. So, um, please review it. And if you've got any questions, you're welcome to drop me an email or phone. So, the idea is we know about earnings per share, the profit earnings, divided by the number of shares in the issue, we've got an earnings per share base. Return to equity, um, I always compare it to loosely to, uh, to, uh, to say, savings account. What would you prefer? 10% returns on your money or 15%? I want a higher return on equity. I'm also looking at sustainability. It's not just having a return of equity of 50%. That's not sustainable over a long period of time. And the net asset value, we spoke already about it before. So that's a one little formula we use. The other one is the EPS growth. So the return, return on equity multiplied by the retention rate. So remember, we pay out out of profits. We pay out a portion of that in dividends. And we re retain back into the business for future growth. That's, ret that's retention rate. That's what we're talking about here. So using those numbers, you'll find that these numbers are a bit more, are better to use for mining companies, for example, companies that have erratic earnings. So we're still using a five-year scenario, okay? Three years, three years back, two years forward, but now we're using return on equity to calculate the sustainable growth rate. When we're not looking at growth in earnings, we're looking at return on uh, return equity as, a, as, a, as an indicator of growth in net asset value. You'll see a slide now, it goes into more detail. So the higher the return in equity, they have to work together, they're married. The higher the return in equity, the higher the price NAV. That's what it justifies that higher rating. The low, low, low uh, RAE and a high price NAV, then the company's expensive. So it works well in stable and in stable uh, uh, capital intensive companies, like the banks. They have to hold a certain amount of capital, so this applies mainly to them. So it's a great tool for recovery stocks, and that's those construction companies I was talking about just now. I believe there will be a recovery. I believe there's opportunity. You'll use these ratios to calculate. Shall I look at a Veng, Group 5, Wilson Bailey, those kind of cyclical stocks also, your resources. This is a much better number. Why? Because it's more stable than at EPS growth. Because remember, the earnings are erratic. This is more stable. So, here's our example. I hope you guys can see these numbers. Um, Okay, you can see the, other, the net ASA, uh, NAV, 112, 121, 136, 157, 175. But there's a steady trend, this growth in the NAV. The return on equity yeah, is relatively stable. Okay, 18, 13, 18, 23. Okay, look at the earnings per share. 18, we drop down to 15. We go up to 22, we drop to 31. Sorry, we go up to 31, we drop to 28. But in two years, okay, year two, and year five, we had, we, we had losses. Can you see that, that erratic volatility? So if you had to use that, those models we're talking about now, on a P-E ratio, you can see uh, on, on 12, the average growth is 12%. So on the first year, they were very, very similar. The, the price and the NAV is not much uh, difference there. Second year, the price is at 172, but it's actually worth 238. So it's trading at a discount. So that was a good time to buy into the share. We're trading at a 38% discount. Next year, there wasn't much growth. Third year, we're outperforming. NAV is at 371, and uh, the share price is at 289. You could have taken your profits in the second year. In the third year, was no growth again. Okay. So this is how you can make better decisions using those kind of financial ratios. I'm um, not going to go into too much detail here. You can see they could compare it now with a uh, return on equity. You see which share is cheaper now. As long as the, you see, here we're talking about a 45% return on equity and the, the price earnings multiple. We're talking about 4.5 times. People are willing to pay a higher price because of the growth potential. 
okay, on the return on equity. But from a valuation point of view, we've got a 50 peg. This year, yeah, uh, return on equity of 15 and a price NAV of 2. That's expensive. It doesn't justify it. Okay. And you can see the average here, talking about 70%. Again, you can see anything below the average and where the market's cheap and expensive. Remember, this is all color coded for you on the website. Just so go for the greens. <laughs> okay. Save, save you a lot of time. So, let's talk about price sales. We spoke about it before, one of those ratios. Historically, well, the research has proven to us that you buy coming with a low price to sales ratio, those are the potential winners. Those are the ones you want to look at. So again, we're looking at normalized operating margin and a five-year sales growth. Sales, sales are quite uh, are steady. You know, the company's going to grow inflation plus 5% or whatever the case might be. But it's quite steady. It's not, as, as not, it's not as hectic. Yeah, hectic. It's not going to go up and down. So it's, it's a good for, value, for loss-making companies. Companies are being loss-making, and now you start looking at these numbers because it doesn't justify. And it's also compared to your peers. It's one of the better ways to compare to your peers. Will this be a recovery situation? So sales growth, as I say, is more stable than EPS and, and uh, EPS growth trends. Um, and obviously, those operating margins, uh, you can compare to, to, your, to your competitors. I always use a pick and pay and shop right. They both sell Colgate toothpaste. Same commodity. Prices are very much the same. They can't really add much difference. And you as a consumer will go there and buy on price. Okay. So you're looking for companies that have a bit more value add to it. They can have a bit more um, meat. <laughs> and those are the companies you want to buy into. So, bottom line, when it comes to, to, to uh, valuing the company, we're not only looking for, for companies that are undervalued on the one side of the coin, because a, a share that's falling might be undervalued, but that's a dog. Okay, it might be value, but it's a dog. There's no quality. So the idea is that you're not only looking for a, company, a fair company at a, at, a, at, a, at a great price, you're looking for a great company at a fair price. Okay. So let's talk about quality. There's a quote from Warren Buffett again. When management with a reputation for brilliance tackles a business with a reputation for poor fundamental economics, it is the reputation of the business that remains intact. So you as an investor, you're going to chase, you're going to chase the dogs. You're wasting your time. You know, rather focus on on the good quality stocks. So this, this process now is to highlight the opportunities for you. So, what makes a good quality company? There's certain things we look at. First of all, must be growing ahead of its competitors. We're grabbing market share, we, we're selling more widgets, higher volumes, whatever the case might be. Five, five years down the line, we are bigger, better, etc. So that's the first thing. There's that growth. Remember, it's not in the growth in the share price, Drive from the business. Um, and obviously, we're selling a profitable product, either at a low cost or we, uh, no, we've got a lot more margin, but we're selling a profitable product. Thirdly, above average earnings on capital. Now, those of you who are business owners, yeah, you guys look at more of the return on capital. I want to see my return on my investment than on, the, on, the, on your revenue. So that's what you're focusing on. The same thing, yeah. I want to see a bigger bank for my buck invested. So um, I want to see my earnings, being, my, my assets being sweated. The thirdly, I'm looking for ca healthy cash generation. You want to go into a situation where you have a bit of a, now cash is king. Cash flow is your lifeblood of your business. Those of you who are business owners, we all know that. Okay, so you want to go into a situation where we, we're lacking funding. So cash generation, very, very important. And then also very important, you know, a lot of the companies on the, well, not a lot of companies, a lot of companies on the JSC, it's focused more on the management of the company instead of shareholders. So um, I, like this, I like to buy into companies that are paying out healthy dividends. Okay. And then thirdly, what's very, very important, ha must have manageable debt levels. Now, you're not going to a situation where um, uh, we've got a potential of being bankrupt because our debt is higher than our, than our equity and that kind of stuff. So, you know, you start looking at debt equity ratios, we look at interest cover. We'll talk about all those kind of things now. So, there are four things, four groups, or four categories we look at based on six, uh, on six uh, financial ratios. Very important, obviously, profitability. So, we're looking at turnover growth, must be beating inflation. And they say inflation is about 6.2, 6 whatever it is. Um, you can be a bit more conservative and say 10% plus, but turnover, turnover must be beating that. Uh, again, high normalized operating margins. So a company with a 5% margin is good. 
compared to the companies with a 2%, but a company with a 10% uh, margin is, is excellent. Those are the kind of companies you want to, you want to see growth in those operating margins. Okay, there's a steady, a steady growth every year. Not the hectic, as long as the trend is up. That's important. And obviously, your average return on equity, above average return on equity, I like 15% plus. Above, return, uh, above average return on, on, on uh, tangible net asset value. Tangible excludes goodwill. So something I can see. So those are some of the ratios we look at. So first of all, profitability. Then I look at quality of reported earnings. I want to see the company converting its, its earnings, its profits, into cash. Okay. Not profits into Porsches. <laughs> So a very important number we look at here is cash flow. And there's a ratio there of 0.75. I want to see converting at least 75% of the, of the earnings into profits. If that trend is going down, and it goes below 50, for example, I get worried. The little red flag goes up. Okay. So, and also, it's important to look at least over three, year, three, three reporting periods. You'll see that trend. And you'll see the next slide I'll go into example. Important dividend policies. All of us know dividend yield. Dividends per share divided by the share price as a percentage. Yeah, we're looking at a percentage of dividends paid out as a percentage of earnings. The average on the market is about a third. Coronation, for example, pays out 90% of its profits. Okay, so different uh, ratios and things like that. I like a high ratio. I like 50% plus. Okay, so the more mature companies would do this. The smaller companies are just starting to grow. Uh, MTN for many years had very, very low dividend yields. They were reinvesting back to the business. Now it's more mature. They're paying out more dividends. Those are the companies you're looking for. And then lastly, obviously, I, I talk about financial risk, the financial structure of the company, debt-equity ratio. Now, 50% of the business is financed from debt and 50% financed from shareholders' funds. 50-50, is that a good or bad scenario? It depends. Can you manage the debt? So we prefer to use interest cover. How many times can the interest bill be paid out of earnings? And for a large cap stock, we like to have three times cover. For mid cap or small caps, at least five times cover. So we say, okay, that, then it's manageable. So that helps us. So there's your five scenarios that we look at. And from that, we base it or we create a, 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 a ratios. And we market it, well, create a rating based out of 100, all those different uh, financial ratios. And then from there, the higher the ratio, the better the quality, the safety of the company. Okay. I like to look at companies with a quality rating of 70 plus. Anything below that, you know, it's not sustain, it's not, um, it's erratic. Those are the companies I want to try and avoid. So the idea is that you don't just use the quality rating by itself. You don't use it in isolation. I use this as one of my third or fourth steps when I'm analyzing the company. So it's a tool to help you in your investment process. The whole idea is that, um, it rates all indices and companies under the same criteria. Obviously, some of the banking stocks and insurance companies, this won't apply. They've got different financial ratios. Okay. But that's all, again, it's, all, it's color coded for you. So here we got this company here. You see the quality rating. Yes, March uh, 2014 and March 2015. The quality rating dropped 10% from 85% to 75%. Now, why did it drop? Now, you start looking at things. Okay, is this turnover beating inflation? No, not really. Okay. Is um, look at the return on equity. Okay, that's another scenario there. Debt equity ratios, I haven't got any really problem with debt equity there. Um, the dividend yields very low. Okay, dividends we're paying out dividends of one point was that uh, one point five and the share price is eight point two. So those are some of the scenarios that you should be looking at. Cash flow is also important. Okay, yes, look like uh, uh, no, that's no problem. But remember you got for three reporting periods. And that's maybe the other thing. So when you read in the report, you can see why the quality rating has dropped. Then you have to say to yourself, is this, will is this continue or is this as a once-off scenario? Okay. So the idea is that you want to understand the business. So you go back here again. Paul Fisher, also a value investor. The nature of the stock itself. So you want to find a company that the share price is not so volatile. It's going to plot along. Those are the kind of companies in itself it's being diversified compared to the market. Okay. So our research that we offer on a daily basis, we put out a thing called daily analysis. So all the trading statements that come out, um, interims and, fi and financials, or the year ends rather, it helps you to keep up to date with what's happening in the market as well as valuations. 
and also introduces you to other opportunities. If you're, if you're looking for stock opportunities, add shares onto your watch list. The daily analysis does it. We go one step further. We create what they call a company analysis, company results analysis. So it's, it's pulled out of the daily analysis. Um, so we look at a whole lot of things. What's the nature of the business? So it's a, it's a four or five page on, on the company based on the latest financials. Uh, detailed information on the company, the different divisions, which can be contributed the most profits and uh, which contributed the most to revenue, that kind of stuff. We give a valuation, we give it a quality rating. All this is all written in the document. You'll see in the next slide. Bottom line, we also give a recommendation. Now, PSG, we don't give advice, specific advice. We don't say, uh, please go, you know, go rush out and go buy bulletins. We give a recommendation. So there's a fine line between advice and recommendation. But you say, based on these numbers, this is what we think from a risk point of view and from a valuation point of view. We think it's undervalued, uh, but be aware of these kind of things. So this is what the report looks like. Okay, there's a three or four pager. Um, I always read the, the, the back column first, that last column, that gives you a recommendation. So it's based on the, in the situation as a whole. Remember, this is a time saver. So it's, you're going through the process of looking for opportunities. I'm looking for shares to add onto my watch list. And I've, oh, this company's got growth prospects, whatever the case might be, I'll add onto my watch list. If it's a dog, I take it off my watch list. I'm tweaking the process on the focus on the potential winners. This is a process that helps you save that time. And from there, you go to the actual company's website and you go ask, you download the, the PDF, the actual financials, and that gives you more, much more information. On our website, where would you find this information? Once you've logged in, if you use username password, you click on, uh, on share info page. Okay, yeah, we're looking at, I can't remember what share this was. Uh, Wilson Bailey. And then there's two little tabs. There's a tab here called research, and then you'll find there's a tab there called company analysis. And that'll bring up that PDF document. Yeah, so we also have, this is, gives you those other tools on our website. We have consensus forecasts. Obviously, these are aggregate reports from all the other stock brokers. Get sent through to BFA. We get it once a week. Okay, the whole idea is you can calculate, analyze growth rates, and this is where they're using more forecast PEs and things like that. I use it as a tool just to compare my analysis to what they do. I just find they never, ever give a sell recommendation. So they're very, very biased. But this is where you'll find it again. Click on um, on research. There's a forecast. So there we go. It gives you a three-year forecast based on certain numbers and things like that, what they think. But I, I find that these guys also get it wrong. So it happens. Okay. So going back to my analogy of the of the property, you know, you're not going to buy just one share. Um, you want to look at a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, sorry, one property. You want to buy, look at other properties. So you want to consider the, the alternatives. So on our website, we have a thing called the value filter. This is your screening. This is a PSG Google. Screen the, scan the market based on certain numbers. Find me the shares. So it's, it's a semi-quants model. Um, and obviously a bit of analyst input and things like that. Um, but it gives you live valuation. So worst case scenario, 50 minute delayed. If you had live prices, those prices are live. Okay. So on our website, you click on, uh, on, on um, what was that? Research. And then filters, there we go. Now, this is where you compare. I'm looking at Wilson Bailey now. So, it's a top up approach. You get a bottom, uh, sorry, bottom up approach. Bottom up, I'm looking at Wilson Bailey. All the numbers look good. What is Piers doing? So, I'm going to look at the, this is the general retailers, but this could have been also the construction sector. Click on the construction sector, and I can compare Wilson Bailey to Irving, to Marion Roberts, to everybody else. All those different numbers. There's 12 different financial ratios that you can use to compare. Okay, so that's based on the on the on the valuation. You click on the tab there, you'll find the, the, the quality tab. So talking about quality filter, remember those four that four groups of quality we're looking at, profitability, uh, cash flow, dividends, and things like that. This is where you'll find it. Same thing now, same uh, group of stocks. You click on the quality tab. There's your quality rating here. If some of these stocks are yellow below 70, they'll be yellow. You want to focus on the stocks that are green. Quality rating, safe. Companies, sustainable. And this last column, by the way, this management comment. It's not our comment. It's a management of the companies themselves. How they see them meeting their forecasted earnings. Is the management? Okay, there we go. One of them. One of them. One of the. Which, which company was that? Uh, <laughs> Vemok. Okay, this is the retailers. So Vemok. The management of the company is negative about them meeting their forecasted uh, earnings. If the management is negative, how should you be? 
also be negative. So you want to go for the companies that are positive. The management's positive. I will meet my forecast earnings, my forecasted sales projections, whatever the case might be. If it's neutral, it depends on the economy. It depends on the range. It depends on this. It depends on that. Yeah. Okay. So I, what I do is, I personally do is, I take this list, I copy it, put it into Excel spreadsheet, and I, I delete the ones that, that I don't like. And from this, I focus on the potential winners. And ultimately, I add the shares into the watch list. And the watch list helps me. I can group a whole lot of different shares together, and it's live. And from there, I can click on the little button called Viewers Investor. It takes me back to the scenario. Okay. So the idea is they can go one step further. We have a search function. So yes, there's a shortcuts. Okay. Um, you can go by the different sectors, or you can scan the whole market. This is scanning the whole market. This is somewhere that's a bit more advanced. You understand what those financial ratios mean. You're developing your own investment philosophy. You know, I talk about having some value stocks in my portfolio. I've got some growth stocks. I like to go for companies that have got um, high dividends. So my fruits, my, I've got a fruit salad portfolio, a bit of everything. So that's my little philosophy there. But the idea is that you can fit into your own investment criteria. But scanning the market based on fundamentals is a special list for shares for you. So less time, remember going through that process of looking at the gravel, ignore the gravel, focus on the gold nuggets. Find me the shares that are undervalued. So there's three scenarios that we use. There we go. Undervalued, uh, investment for dividends, or, or growth stocks. So quality stocks, undervalued quality stocks, there's the criteria. Quality rating above 70 and the peg ratio between 35 and 75. So it's all preset for you. Click on the button, spits out a list of stocks for you. Uh, growth stocks, now I'm looking for a company, it's not only growth, it's growth at a reasonable price. We call it GARP. Growth at a reasonable price. I always call it a swan, sleep well at night. It's a different kind of strategy. So your, um, your forecasted growth in earnings is more than 15%. Peg ratio, so we're going slightly bit higher. We go up to 100. So um, you can see the criteria. And then thirdly, investing for dividends. So again, the quality rating, all of, these, all of them use a quality rating. So it's a balance. But yeah, I'm looking for a company that's paying at least a third of its, uh, of its dividends. Uh, at least a, a third of its uh, uh, earnings in dividends. Quality rating above 70, plus NAV, 50% premium. Those are three, it's all set up for you already. Click on those little buttons and it spits out a list of stocks for you. So um, just give you, a, just before I end up quickly, our, our track record, we, we put out, we've got two portfolios we, we, we track on a, on a weekly basis. We focus on, we do, on the large cap stocks, so it's the top 100 shares, and then small caps, anything outside of that range. So we look at a whole lot of different criteria. This is our, our large cap portfolio. This is the average of the, the top 40. We only been tracking for the last four years. We've been doing it for 15, but uh, you can see how we've been outperforming it every, uh, slightly every year. Uh, last year, we, we, we did not do so well, thanks to Wilson Bailey and thanks to, um, what was the other one? Um, Wilson Bailey took the dip. Uh, Eltron. Okay, those are the two companies. But you can see our, our, our five-year compounded average growth. The, J, the top 40 index, 11.4, we're coming at 13.1. Okay, so it's, already, it's, it's, it's rebalanced every year. We're not taking consideration, obviously, uh, costs and dividends and things like that, but we do take in consideration special dividends. Okay, that's our, our large caps. He has our small caps also outperforming. So our track record, not, not, not doing too well. I mean, not doing too badly. Okay. So quickly, before I can handle any questions, the other idea is to think like a business person. Do you agree that business people think differently? Okay. Um, I, I, deal, I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs. I enjoy entrepreneurs. You know, they're creative, they have a tolerance for risk, but also I believe they have a desire for achievement. You guys are here because you want to learn how to do it yourself, you want to take control of your own financial future. You are business people. Instead of running a business, you're going to be part, part owner in a business. So we do think differently. We see the bigger picture. Okay, we look into the future. We're looking for tomorrow's opportunities. That's what we do as, as investors. So as a value investor, you're a bargain hunter. So yes, we're looking at the numbers, quantitative numbers, but also the qualitative. The two approaches, very important. So it's very well to look at value, but also quality. And obviously, the most important, central to your philosophy, must be that margin of safety. I've got limited downside risk. Sorry. And then lastly, obviously, 
being a value investor, you're contrarian. You're going against the flow. When everyone else is selling, you're buying. And everyone else is buying, you're selling. Okay, so um, that's, that's the whole thinking about it. So it works well for Warren Buffett, and I believe that uh, uh, I think he's doing okay for himself. <laughs> so in conclusion, if you guys haven't got an account with us yet, come test us out. You can open up a free trial account, have access to our research, see what it's all about, can play around with our watch list, can look at our research. Okay. Um, and then obviously the research tools, the value filter, um, watch list, all this kind of information. It's available, it's both available for free. So test us out. You know what PhD stands for? Profits are great, people so good. Come join us. It's not pizza geld, okay? Pit moton. No. <laughs> so from our side, good luck and happy trading. Thank you very much. Okay, questions? It's, a, it's already undervalued. Remember yeah, but I mean, should I wait for it to move into that green market? Well, no, you can even buy it at those prices, but to find out why is, the, why is the market rating it so, you know, as I say, insiders might know something and they're, they're hammering the stock down. The market doesn't know about it. So, you know, I'll, I'll go look at things like cash flow. I'll go look at previous records. Something's happened in the past. What's happening with the company? I'll go do further analysis. But to me, what's important is cash flow, number one, interest cover. That, that is a financial risk. A lot of times you pick up opportunities where the companies are, they're, they've been unduly hammered by the market. And that's where the opportunities lie. So don't, you don't have to wait for them to come back. Just do your analysis at what's happening right now. Does that answer your question? Great. Any other questions? No. We're not forecasting. Now we're not forecasting. We're just we're just taking a rolling 12-month period. So uh, it's not it's not our fault. We forecast the growth, earnings growth. Yes, that's our forecast. That's also based, as I say, three years back, and we forecast two years forward. But the rolling PE is just 12-month period. Instead of, so things, instead of comparing interims to interims and year to year end, we're taking that the 12-month period. Okay. Yeah, we're always using a five-year model. So it's a rolling, rolling five year. Yeah. 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 We obviously can use much more than that. We've got a 15 year history, but we use, we're using a five year all the time. Bright is very similar to Remgro, Rem they, uh, they investment company. So they're difficult to invest. You look at more the price in AV, that kind of stuff. So you know, we're looking at earnings. So you, you look at price in AV, um, that's how I would look at it. I don't know much about Stella. But Bright, that's the one you would look at. It's an investment holding company. Yeah, but I'm asking specifically with your research. Yeah, we do cover them, but um, you know, you'll be focusing. I'll look at more of the price NAV instead of price uh, uh, instead of PEG. I'll look at price NAV as a ratio to value the company. Well, first of all, we don't, we don't do any analysis on our own companies. Well, we do, but we don't put it out there. <laughs> well, the challenge is we, you haven't got all the numbers. So you can't really compare apples with apples. You can't. You haven't got all the numbers for PSG Consult. Well, we don't give you the numbers, so it's it's a difficult one to answer that one. Um, uh, I'm married to the stock, so <laughs> I like it. <laughs> well, that's that, that's why why the quality rating is so important. You know, in the past, looking at all those different those those numbers, and uh, it's, it's 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 there's no erratic numbers. There's no now, the cash flow, profitability has always been there. That will come through in the quality rating. If something changes radically, you'll pick it up. And that's where you say like cooking the books. <laughs> Let me put it this way. I'm a SaaS shareholder for many, many years. I bought them when they were 20 bucks. They were in riders 500 bucks, and they dropped to 250. At 500 rand, I thought they were cheap. And when they dropped to 250, I bought more. Um, so if you bought the shares a few years ago and you thought they were cheap, right now they're even cheaper. As, of, as your fundamentals change, as, if you, as your, well, and, and this is again, coming back to the question right at the beginning, I ask you guys, who are the traders, who are the investors? And I said specifically, buy and hold, buy and sell. So I would sell the stock, my original decision has changed. Now I bought into MTN because I believe in cell phones and now they're going to sell oil. Vice, vice versa, Cecil, um, they're going to sell cell phones. Now my original decision has changed. I'll do that. Secondly, if the companies become expensive, I might put a 20% stop loss on. Or, um, you know, I remember years ago when, when Sassel did drop, it was more the, the RAND than anything else. So in Glencore's situation, is it the business? Or as you say, it's the economy. So all those things you have to take in consideration. And also, you know, 
are you investor or trader? Now that if they claim cause were cheap then, now they're cheaper, I buy more. I average down. <laughs> as, as, inv as investor, I'll average down. I buy in the dips. <laughs>